Did you know that animals see the world differently from us? Take this. Pigeons actually have better vision than humans. Crazy, right? So let's try to see the world from the animal's eyes. Let's start with snakes. Their way of seeing the world is totally different from ours. They have special infrared sensitive receptors in their snouts. This allows them to see the radiated heat of warm blooded mammals. Now let's move on to cows. These big guys don't see colors as well as humans do. They can't see the color red because they don't have the necessary receptors in their retinas for that. So they only perceive variations of blue and green. Also, they don't like it when someone approaches them from behind. They have a near panoramic vision and the only area they can't see is directly to the back. So if you're ever sneaking up on a cow, make sure you give them a heads up. Horses have a blind spot right in front of their faces because of their eye placement. This means they can't see things directly in front of them. Also, they don't see as many colors as we do. Just like cows, their world is mostly made up of greens, yellows, and blues. Poor guys. Fish eyes have ultraviolet receptors and a more spherical lens than humans. This gives them an almost 360 degree vision. As for colors, they're able to see all the same ones as we humans do. But because light behaves differently underwater, they have a hard time discerning red and its shades. Deep sea fish can easily see in the dark, which is pretty cool. Sharks, on the other hand, can't distinguish colors at all, but they see much clearer under the water than we do. Birds have some pretty unique ways of seeing the world. Unlike humans, birds can see ultraviolet light. This helps them differentiate between males and females of their own species, as well as better navigate in their surroundings. Also, they are very good at focusing. For example, falcons and eagles can focus on a small mouse in the field up to a distance of one mile. A pigeon can see all the tiny details. So if you ever need to find a crack in the pavement, just ask a pigeon. And by the way, it has a 340 degree field of vision, and generally their vision is considered twice as good as a human's. There, you have it. I'm envious of a pigeon. Insects have some weird vision patterns too. Flies, for example, have thousands of little eye receptors that work together to give them a big picture of what's going on around them. And get this, they see everything in slow-mo. Plus, they can see ultraviolet light. It helps them with communication. Bees have their own problems. These guys can't tell what the color red is. To them, it looks like a dark blue. How messed up is that? Now, rats. These little guys can't see red either, but that's not the weirdest part. Either of their eyes moves on its own, so they're seeing double, like all the time. It's a wonder they don't run into more walls, am I right? Cats don't see shades of red or green, but they do see brown, yellow, and blue hues like a boss. Plus, they got a wide-angle view, so they can peep more stuff on the sides than we can. There's more, though. When it's pitch black outside, cats become ninja-like and can see six times better than us. Their pupils adjust to any lighting like magic. Now let's talk about dogs. These furry friends can't see red or orange, but they do rock at blue and violet. Plus, they can differentiate 40 shades of gray. I mean, it's not 50, but still impressive. On a related note, frogs are really picky eaters. They won't even bother with food that isn't moving. They could be surrounded by a buffet of delicious bugs, but if they don't wiggle, frogs won't even bat an eye, and they're not the most observant creatures either. If something isn't important to them, like a shadow, they won't even bother looking at it. Chameleons have eyes that can move independently of each other, so they can see everything around them without even turning their heads. They can even see two images at the same time, like a double feature movie, one in front and one behind. Pretty impressive, right? What would you do if you suddenly got 360 degree vision like a chameleon? Share in the comments. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. <laughs>
couldn't imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs, and they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions. But a Tigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents, and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently, but a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth. False killer whales have 44. And their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine. You have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England. And it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So, some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too, and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match, but in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. But there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it, there are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? 
Savannah cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanky, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. You'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? Yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a comma. Similar to beefalo, the comma also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. Commas don't have camel humps. Their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual-looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar-looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family. So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild. So Megalodon was one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters on our planet. Powerful jaws, razor-sharp teeth, gigantic eyes. But what do you know about how it sounded? Imagine how loudly it growled, permeating the underwater world with sound vibrations. This sound resembled eh, nothing. Megalodon didn't have a voice. It was a shark, and sharks don't have sound-producing organs. It was a quiet danger. But despite its muteness, yes, that is a word, you could have still heard it. Come with me. Now you're underwater, clenching your fist, raising your hand, and quickly bringing it down. Now imagine that you have a big submarine instead of a fist, and hear the water flowing around the smooth surface of the hull. That's what a megalodon sounded like. 
When this monster was swimming out to the surface and opening its jaws, it sounded like a waterfall. The giant shark swam at high speed. When the water was passing through its mouth and gills, it sounded like a flowing river, a fast, powerful river. Megalodon had no voice, only the scary sound of flowing water. Other ancient fish could make sounds, but you would hardly hear them. Whales, dolphins, and their distant ancestors are not counted because they're mammals. Fish communicated at frequencies elusive to human ears. They still have this ability. But in most, the ocean was and is a pretty quiet place. So let's get out on ancient lands and check what was going on with the sounds there. Thanks to modern technologies, scientists can analyze the sounds of many ancient animals. Using CT scans, they found that some dinosaurs had complex systems of small open pockets in their skulls. They used these winding cranial mazes to reproduce a wide range of sounds and regulate body temperature. And people have managed to hear them. An ancient bird that lived 79 to 140 million years ago, Vegasus, sounded similar to some farm birds like duck and geese. But the ancient creature probably screamed in a scarier way. Scientists found this out thanks to the Shrinks fossil they discovered in 2016 in Antarctica. It's the oldest known vocal organ in the world. It helped Vegasus make a double humming sound coming from the left and right sides of the Shrinks. Imagine a duck and goose screaming. Increase the volume several times. Perhaps that's what its distant ancestors sound like. As for other flying reptiles like the pterodactyl, it couldn't scream like Vegasus because it didn't have a syrinx. These winged monsters could growl, hiss, and snap their beaks. And this was their most effective sound. Remember any tall basketball player. The skull of the pterodactyl was slightly longer than their height. Just imagine what a noise the dinosaur created when it was snapping its powerful beak. The clicking sound could deafen and frighten other ancient creatures nearby. Now, you probably know what a Tyrannosaurus sounds like, thanks to the movies. Among thousands of others, you'll recognize this prolonged roar similar to a chainsaw, vacuum cleaner, and horn. And, honestly, its roar has a lot in common with the natural sounds that this monster could make. Thanks to modern technologies and well-preserved remains, scientists managed to simulate the voice of these ancient animals. Imagine you're uploading data about a T-Rex into a program and preparing to hear an intimidating roar. You press play, and it sounds like a bee. Tyrannosaurus rex's scream was similar to birds, not mammals. But it wasn't just a bee. It used nostrils to scream, not a mouth. The hum came from the chest and resembled a siren with low bass. Maybe it sounded a lot more intimidating than what we saw in the movies. It was louder than all the trumpets of the symphony orchestra. And it did it only with the help of its nose. It's not known for sure whether it could growl through the mouth. You could also hear how long-necked dinosaurs sounded in the movies. Their calls were similar to those of elephants. Something between a saxophone and a car horn. But in fact, these tall creatures whispered. Almost all mammals make sounds thanks to the laryngeal nerve. This nerve runs down along the neck, then goes around the blood vessels of the chest and comes back to the larynx. In short, the brain gives a signal and it passes twice the distance along the body before the sound is released from the mouth. And now, remember those long necks of dinosaurs? This was the height of a five-story building. But the voice signal had to run a distance of 10 floors. It took too long to make this long trip. And this affected the dinosaur's roar. So when they wanted to make a sound, they just hissed. And it was probably similar to the sound of a giant viper. But the most detailed sounds scientists have managed to get belongs to the Parasaur olephus. You know this herbivorous dinosaur thanks to the long crest on the back of its head. We saw the dinosaur using it in movies and documentaries to fight opponents and enemies. Some scientists believed it also used the comb to drop fruits and leaves from trees. Others thought the dinosaur used it to improve its sense of smell. But it turned out that in addition to self-defense and fighting, they used the comb to make loud and scary sounds in different keys. Scientists replicated this with fantastic accuracy thanks to the structure of its hard tissues. Almost all living beings with a voice use soft organs to make sounds. And these soft tissues decompose quickly. Parasar olefus had solid ones. 
They noticed tubes leading from the nostrils to the crest and back to the nostrils when they found the skull. It was like a crumhorn, a curved musical wind instrument. This proved the dinosaur used the crest on the back of its head to make the sounds louder. The comb allowed it to trumpet, so its relatives could hear it in the forest. They made humming sounds with low and high notes. Mix a saxophone and trumpet with a goose hum, car horns, and low frequencies, then increase the volume several times. That's what Parasar Olaphus sounded like. That's also what my 4th grade band sounded like. But I digress. You can listen to different shades and timbers of this dinosaur on the internet. It used noises with different tones to create complex social connections. They could communicate, identify each other, trumpet danger, or conversely, signal their friendly intentions. Alright, we've just heard how some ancient reptiles sounded. But what about ancient insects? They didn't have vocal cords, of course. Instead, they used friction between body parts. Look at modern crickets chirping with their wings. One wing has tiny notches. The second has the shape of a mediator. Take a simple plastic comb and run your fingertip over its teeth. Crickets make their sounds by the same principle. Their wings vibrate and release a series of sound waves into the air. But the clicking of an ancient bush cricket was very different from modern insects since they were much noisier. The sounds of these clicks were like a whistle. With the help of high-frequency waves, they could also communicate secretly as if they were doing it through a closed radio channel. If you heard this, you would hardly be able to fall asleep to it. Now, modern crickets are not so loud as they began to add more high frequencies to their sounds. Higher pitch waves don't spread as far, reducing the risk that a bat will hear the insects. Just imagine how the jungle of that time sounded. The loud chirping of crickets hurts the ears. Then you hear a brachiosaurus hissing. The clicks of pterodactyls shake the sky like thunderclaps. Then you hear the trumpet sounds of different tones somewhere in the jungle. These are Parasar olifus communicating with each other. And then you get scared by a loud Tyrannosaurus siren. What a racket! You'd probably not find peace in such conditions. Fortunately, humans appeared millions of years later. And by the way, scientists have managed to find out and understand what our distant ancestors sounded like. They carefully examined the insert function of the mouth, nose, and throat on the Neanderthal skeleton. Their voices were similar to ours, but the phonetic range of an adult Neanderthal was the same as if they were two to three years old. It was like mumbling without consonant sounds. The study of the skull couldn't recreate precisely the sound of Neanderthals. But in 2007, scientists extracted DNA samples from their bones. They found a variation of the gene that responds to human speech. Scientists believe that Neanderthals fought with Homo sapiens. You know, our family tree. As a result of this conflict, their kind became extinct. But the found gene points they could have had other connections with each other. Perhaps Neanderthals could understand their language and even pronounce some words. Jellyfish and coral. One looks like a plant while the other swims like a fish. And yet, somehow they're related. These two belong to the same family group of creatures with stinging tentacles. Ow! Hard to say it for coral, but it's actually an animal. Plants make their own food, corals don't. They're made up of thousands of polyps, which are tiny coral creatures. They have kind of small tentacle-like arms they use to catch food and sweep it into their mouths. They look all innocent and harmless like a marine flower just standing there doing nothing. That's probably what jellyfish think too, floating near them, hiding from some bigger predators. And bam, when it least expects it, coral grabs one. Biologists were surprised at how strong coral was. Catching a bigger animal that moves, unlike them, was excellent teamwork. A couple of polyps grab the jelly's bell with tentacles, while others quickly go for its feeding arms. And poor jelly has no chance to escape. Since they're distant cousins, scientists believe corals are immune to the venom from jelly stingers. Scorpions and ticks Ticks sure look like insects, but following their lineage, scientists realize they're closely related to scorpions. They can both live on liquid food, have a great sense of smell, which they use to find food, and eight legs. Scorpions are better at surviving harsh conditions. They can go an entire year without food. But when eating, which is every couple of weeks, they don't only go for small critters like insects and spiders, but for mice and some lizards too. 
It looks like both of them have been around for over 400 million years. Yep, long before dinosaurs arrived. Or me. Scientists think they could be one of the first animals that moved from water to land. They found the fossilized claw of a sea scorpion 18 inches long, which implies the beast itself was 8 feet long. In fact, after finding the claw, scientists realized giant crabs, scorpions, and spiders used to be way bigger than we think. Meerkats and civet cats. They look like cats, and yet neither is remotely related to them. But they have pretty long, nimble bodies, which makes them distant cousins of weasels and mongooses. They both bring their juveniles in underground dens. But meerkats like teamwork. They do most stuff together, which includes taking care of and raising young ones. Civets are more introverts that don't like group gatherings. When born, they're fully furred, can move, and are basically ready for the world. Meerkats in the earliest stages of life don't have senses and need a little more time to mature. As adults, they're pretty tough, though. Strong enough to survive snake's venom, have their own methods of catching scorpions, excellent vision, and are able to survive without water. They only get liquid from what they eat. Civets are nocturnal, while meerkats appreciate a good night's snooze and are active during the day. Humans and kangaroos Well, we kind of split our ways around 150 million years ago, but we still have a common lineage and, as scientists discovered a couple of years ago, an almost identical genome. This may give us more answers about what we were like back in the day. Good, I wasn't around then. While the right hand is dominant in most humans, some of us are left-handed. It's the same for kangaroos. After they started walking on two legs, they got two free hands to perform other tasks, which is when one side naturally became dominant. As for the tail, kangaroos, like most mammals, have it for a better balance, especially when running. In our evolutionary family tree, the tail disappears. Gorillas, chimps, or other apes, including us, don't have it. Four-legged animals need a lot of energy for every step they take, while we can walk on two legs more easily because of gravity. Every time we take a step, it kind of pulls us forward. That way, we use 25% less energy than we would walking on all fours. So now, we don't need tails to balance. Ants and bees. Wait a minute, Aunt Bee? From the Andy Griffith Show? She was an insect? Mm, no. If there was a family reunion, bees wouldn't invite wasps. Scientists used to think ants were closer relatives to wasps. It turns out they're related to just some species like digger wasps and more likely to bees. Both ants and bees have specific eyes made up of other tiny eyes and antennae. They're both social, live in bigger groups, they're hardworking and strongly appreciate teamwork. They build nests and return there after eating. They're also both very socially responsible. Ants clean the environment, remove leaves, food leftovers, remains of bugs, eat harmful insects, and dig tunnels, which helps plants grow better since there's more air reaching the soil. Bees make honey and pollinate flowers, which is part of the reason why nature is so diverse. Birds and dinosaurs Birds come from a meat-eating group where T. rex also belongs, called theropods. Ooh, here a pod, there a pod, everywhere a pod. <clears throat> Fossils of ancient birds are 150 million years old. They look like small dinosaurs with feathers, and also had sharp teeth. But many dinos had feathers too, and not only those that could fly. T. rex juveniles would come out of an egg in the shape of soft, fuzzy balls, similar to birds. Feathers were useful to keep them warm and protected. Velociraptor was also covered in feathers and had jointed wrists, hinged ankles, and three toes. Some dinosaurs also had hollow bones. Some sat on eggs to keep them warm, while others slept with their head under the arm with folded limbs, just like birds. And the claws were similar, too. Whales and cows A long, long time ago, around 50 million years, you weren't around either, there was a small animal walking along the rivers of southern Asia. It had hooves and slender legs. The creature would feed on land, but whenever it sensed something dangerous coming, it would hop into the water for safety. This animal, Indohues, was the earliest relative of what we know today as whales and dolphins. Once this unusual creature got to the water, it was more clear how it evolved into a whale. Its relatives that stayed on the land hit a different direction. They're what we know today as hoofed mammals, including cows, sheep, pigs, giraffes, camels, deer, and even hippos. Horseshoe crabs and spiders. These crabs do have a shell similar to other crabs and spend most of their time crawling around the seafloor. But despite that and their name, 
they're more related to spiders than other crabs they probably hang out with. Horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes on their sides and back, blue blood, and can replace body parts. How handy! This crab has a segmented body with jointed legs, just like spiders do. They've been on Earth for 500 million years already, and their prehistoric ancestors could grow up to 2 feet. They had pretty long tails, which they used as a digging tool when they needed to get the food. With their tails, they can even right themselves when they fall and end up upside down. Luckily for us, they never evolved enough to end up walking on land, as their cousins do. Now, an interesting trio here. Tapers, horses, and rhinos. Although tapers look more like pigs with trunks, they're related to neither those nor the elephants. Rhinos originally come from North America, and the early ones didn't look like the big, thick-skinned rocks we see today. They were slender mammals, the size of a pony. Some of the earliest horses also wandered those same areas and looked like small dogs with hoofed toes. The first tapers were small, too. Scientists also discovered a little hoofed mammal, here's her long name, that lived in India, which was an island back then, over 50 million years ago. Its lower jawbones were fused, and the creature was an herbivore, just like horses and rhinos. It wasn't their ancestor, but it helped the scientists figure out how these three go in the same group. Elephant and sea cow Sea cows used to walk on land, and the proof is that scientists found an interesting animal, this guy, from the sea cow's early family tree. It lived in prehistoric Jamaica and went extinct 40 million years ago. Today's sea cow weighs like an average piano, and you can find them in rivers and shallow coastal waters of the Caribbean, Amazon River, West Africa, and the southern U.S., where they're called manatees. The elephant weighs as much as a school bus and lives in tropical areas of Asia and Africa. They took different paths, but seeing this unusual-looking fella, you can somehow see the connection there. You call your beloved cat to have his dinner. Sir Scratchy. Suddenly, you hear loud stomping. The dishes on the dinner table clink with every thump. A painting's fallen off the wall. Is it an earthquake? No, that's a cat the size of a pony walking into the dining room. It needs ten times as much food as the average cat. And it purrs like a tractor. No, Scratchy, stop rolling. You'll turn over the cupboard. Well, this is one possible scenario for the evolution of animals in the future. Climate, water, oxygen in the air, and even gravity are factors that influence the course of evolution. For example, scientists predict that some bird species will gradually lose their warm feathers. In the future, they will basically look like sphinx cats with beaks and wings. The same thing might happen to our pets. Gradually, their fur will become shorter until they're completely bald. Urban pests like pigeons and rats will become even bigger, the size of a cat. A few million years ago, rats were barely the size of your little finger. That's because they hid in small burrows and had to be nearly invisible to large predators. Now, they live in comfortable cellars that humans have built. They can create cozy nests there. And the large amount of food in trash cans keeps them from starving. So they feel quite comfortable and continue to grow in size. Even more, rats have already developed oily fur so that dirty or toxic water can run off them without harming the rodents themselves. Plant-eating mammals, on the other hand, might have it worse. Their food will gradually diminish. With time, there will be fewer forests and greenery on the planet, and some plants will disappear altogether. Eventually, animals like deer, elephants, giraffes, and others will get smaller and smaller because of the lack of food. In addition to shrinking, mammals will have smaller eyes so they don't lose water from their bodies, and their ears will become larger to lose heat through them. Their tails will grow longer to swat away insects. As land mammals become smaller, birds will increase in size. That's because they'll be able to include shrinking animals in their diet, and the muscles of birds will become much stronger because they'll have to fly long distances in search of food. Animals in hot and dry places are more likely to learn how to get water from the air. To do so, they'll need long sails or skin flaps. Early in the morning, when the air is coolest, moisture will accumulate on these new body parts, and some lizards will evolve their collars to a much larger size. Then they'll be able to collect more rainwater. As for the marine world, we can already see some fish jumping out of the water to catch insects. 
In the course of evolution, fish fins may become longer and stronger so that they can leap further. And gradually, those fins will turn into wings to make them truly flying fish. Perhaps in the future, these fish will hunt small birds. To do that, they'll learn to hold their breath for longer and fly much higher. But the big fish and marine mammals will have a hard time. The ocean will heat up and some species will begin to disappear. The largest inhabitant of the aquatic world, the blue whale, which is the size of two school buses, will shrink in size because there will be less food for it in the ocean. But the population of lizards and reptiles will thrive. They're good at absorbing heat. And with climate change, there will be more insects on our planet, which means more food for lizards. They'll start to increase in size. But now, they'll have to defend themselves against big birds. Their legs will become longer and stronger, so they'll be able to run a lot faster and not get eaten by a bird. And the insects? Well, they'll just explode. Insects will probably live in huge swarms and fly around looking for food. And they'll be angry and hungry because their usual source of food, mammals, will have either ceased to exist or shrunk in size. Humans will change too. Scientists predict that between 1,000 and 1 million years from now, we will completely lose our hair. Our limbs will become thinner and longer and will be about seven feet tall. Our feet will most likely lose their toes because they're no longer needed to keep our balance. Our head and brain will become more like a balloon and our lifespan will be more than 100 years. Because humans are at the top of the food chain and don't take part in natural selection, we'll gradually become similar to each other. In tens of millions of years, all humans will probably look the same. Plus, we're developing genetic engineering technology. Luminous rabbits, incredibly sized cows, web-weaving goats, super muscular pigs, and more. But we're more interested in how animals will evolve on their own. So, fast forward ahead in time. Humans have long lived on other planets and in other galaxies. Earth has long since become home to animals and plants. The only traces of humans here are giant cities made of metal and concrete that are buried deep underground. And up there, incredible creatures like the Necropteryx live. It's something between an ostrich and a vulture the size of an adult human. Its long and powerful beak is its main tool for protection against predators and for eating. Their strong legs with long claws make them excellent runners. This creature can walk dozens of miles in a day. Necropteryx needs warm fur or feathers. Without humans and the greenhouse effect, the temperature on Earth has dropped. But with a warm jacket, they'll be able to survive even a new ice age. And like ostriches, they reproduce by laying eggs. This is a parish shrew. It's like a common shrew, a couple of inches long. But it has an unusual feature, a parachute on its tail. While little, they live in their parents' nests. But when they leave them, they launch themselves into the air and then open a parachute made of thin fur. The warm currents of air rise up and carry them. They can spend up to 24 hours in the air. Then they'll nest elsewhere and their babies will leave their home the same way. The waka, waka waka. This animal looks like a striped giraffe with only two legs. It'll be one of the fastest creatures on our planet. No predator can beat it in a race. Plus, their eyes are perched high on their head. And with its long neck, the waka can see a threat even when sitting in tall grass. Terabytes are descendants of termites that will appear on Earth in 200 million years. If they see a threat, they'll spew a stream of chemicals, something like acid, from their huge head. Even the biggest predators will be afraid to approach them. Reed stilts are about three and a half feet tall and weigh almost as much as an adult human. Thanks to its striped coloring, a reed stilt is almost invisible in the reeds. It walks on its thin legs through marshy terrain and feeds on small fish. Its long neck and sharp teeth allow it to dash into the water, almost cobra-like. It catches fish and swallows them almost whole. But all of these predictions are very speculative. There are billions of factors that influence the course of evolution. The course of evolution could go the other way at any time. For example, an asteroid hits the Earth, causing a mass extinction and changing our planet's climate. 
a small percentage of surviving organisms begin to adapt to the new conditions. In a few million years, we'll have animals that none of us could have even imagined. Fail. Ah, oh, what a waste of an hour running around with a rolled up newspaper trying to get that fly that keeps buzzing around your head. Well, three things. Why isn't it afraid of you? And why won't it just fly away? And how is it so incredibly fast? Flies actually have a pretty normal speed for their size. You're just a bit too slow. A tiny fly brain reacts several times faster than yours to what it sees. One second to the fly feels like five or six to you. When a fly looks at you, it sees you as if you're hanging out at the bottom of your local pool, moving around really slowly. What if you dropped a balloon from your bedroom window and watched it fall to the ground? That's how slow a fly sees regular things fall. So it has ninja reaction speeds, but it also has special eyes. They're divided into thousands of receptors that capture light all at the same time. You use small muscles to turn your eyes and head around to look in different directions. Flies don't have these muscles. They don't need them. They can see in every direction at the same time almost. No matter what side you attack from, that fly's almost definitely going to see it coming. You've probably seen supersonic planes in the movies, turning and flipping around at warp speed. A fly's kind of like that, but with way cooler wings. It can change directions mid-flight, stop, and dodge any obstacles. It can even calculate a flight strategy before it takes off. Well, this time you're really going to swat that fly. As you raise your rolled-up paper, the insect's brain calculates where it's going to land. The fly immediately puts its body in the perfect position, ready to perform an evasive maneuver. If your hand moves in front of the insect, its legs immediately tilt backwards to help it fly off in the other direction. Wow, that fly would make a great boxer or soccer goalie. So why does that fly even bother sticking around? You're always trying to squish it. Well, because your body is a five-star feast and your skin is the buffet table with row upon row of tasty treats. Mm. As you move about your day, your skin releases sweat, proteins, carbs, salt, sugar, and all other chemicals that flies are crazy about. Imagine you're hungry and thirsty, walking through a desert. You come over a tall sand dune and see it. Free food! Tables of fruit, candy, sandwiches, and the world's biggest soda fountain. The bouncer looks big, tough, round. It's a giant slow turtle. Now you know why the fly sticks around. You're the turtle. You actually do have a chance to get that fly. But it's still going to get away 8 times out of 10. Say a fly sitting on your kitchen table. Here's what you do. You need to aim a few inches in front of where you think it's going to fly to. The fly brain will think you're aiming right at it, so you can actually outwit the fly and take it by surprise. The problem? It's really hard to predict the fly's escape route. So you're too slow. How about calling in some backup? Meet the tiger beetle. Speed, 8 feet per second. It can't fly, but that doesn't matter. This beetle runs so fast, it loses the ability to see while it's moving. It aims itself at a target and then runs. It's not a ninja like the fly, and it can't change directions mid-sprint. It has to stop before each run. You walk it around 4.5 feet per second, so the beetle goes like twice your speed. But for its size, it's incredibly fast. It runs 125 lengths of its body in one second. Now, say you're 6 feet tall. You have to run 750 feet in one second. As long as it's on the same surface as that pesky fly, the fly doesn't stand a chance. Or maybe it's time to call in air support. The dragonfly is the fastest flying insect in the world. This little creature can reach 35 miles per hour. That's faster than you riding your bike down a steep hill. The dragonfly's wings also allow it to fly back, right, left, up and down, just like a helicopter. Doesn't matter how fast the fly moves, it's pretty much game over. Flies, dragonflies, and tiger beetles are fast because they don't want to spend a lot of extra time out in the open. There are a lot of hungry creatures around. But there's one insect that runs fast because if it stopped, ouch! To meet a speedy silver ant, you need to go to the Sahara Desert. The sand here is so hot, you could fry an egg on it. 
Mmm, sandy. That's why the silver ant speeds at around 2.5 feet per second. It doesn't want to burn its feet. It also has triangle-shaped hair that reflects heat, helping the ant escape the scorching sun. If that ant were human-sized, it could run at 400 miles per hour, faster than the fastest car in the world. There's another ant that holds a speed record. The Dracula ant can't run as fast as the silver ant, but it has the fastest mouth in the world, um, other than me. It can open and close its jaws 5,000 times, all in the blink of an eye. Literally. How about another fast one, this time a bit closer to home, or in it? The American cockroach can hide in the walls, behind the stove, pretty much anywhere. It's almost impossible to catch. It can run 5 feet per second. That's because of its 6 legs. Each one has 3 knees. Its legs are covered with small hairs that sense any change in the air. That's why it reacts so fast when you walk into the kitchen and turn the light on. And the world record for fastest creature on land is the size of a sesame seed. It's a type of mite, and it can move at 322 body lengths per second. If you zap the mite to turn it to human size, it could go almost two times faster than the speed of sound. The mite can even change direction while moving. That makes it the fastest, most elusive creature on the planet. But let's find some animals that actually make us feel good about ourselves. The garden snail. It belongs to the mollusk family, and it likes to take its sweet time. If you were moving at snail speed, you'd take two steps every two hours. But snails don't care. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Snails use their shell for protection, but they have other tricks too. Some snails give off a nasty smell so that no one bothers them. (laughs) If it gets too hot and dry, snails hide in their shells and seal themselves in using that cool slime they make. That slime also helps them climb up trees. Sloths are the slowest mammals on the planet. Thanks to their slow metabolism, food can take up to 16 days to get digested. Wouldn't be that hard to catch up to one of them. But their slowness actually helps them. You know how in the movies they say, stop, don't make any sudden movements? Well, a sloth has that part down cold. Other animals simply don't notice them up there among the leaves. Manatees are one of the slowest sea creatures. But they're not too worried about anyone messing with them, except for humans in motorboats. They are huge, and they have thick, thick skin. It's like a sea tank, but way cuter. Another slow swimmer is the Greenland shark. It swims at less than one mile per hour. Like the manatee, it's large and in charge. No one's likely to challenge it face to face. But this all leads to the most hilarious snacking technique ever. The Greenland shark is basically slower than every single fish in the water. The only chance it has is to wait for some of those fish to fall asleep. Then it's snack time. The cool thing is that their easygoing lifestyle actually prolongs their life. The average lifespan of a Greenland shark is 300 to 500 years. They live in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. Imagine you're on a cruise and you see one of these slow motion giants. It might be 400 years older than you. Squirrel's teeth never stop growing, but the animals wear them down by gnawing on nuts and other hard foods. The front of the rodent's teeth is actually orange. It's because they're covered in special tough enamel. Bet you're glad you don't have that to deal with. Some bird species don't mind munching on chili peppers. That's because they can't feel the heat. Peppers burn your mouth because they contain a special chemical, capsaicin. But birds don't have the taste buds needed to feel its effects. The rhino's horn is made of hair, or at least the same protein that makes up your hair and nails. This protein is called keratin. Such a horn is kind of unique since other animals have horns with a bony center. The woodpecker can peck the wood 20 times per second. This pace is almost too high for the human eye to notice. How much wood would a woodpecker peck if a woodpecker could peck wood? The number of pecks often reaches a total of 8,000 to 12,000 a day. A starfish does have eyes, one on the end of each of its arms. These eyes are light-sensitive groups of cells. Frogs don't need to drink water, 
Instead, they have an area known as the drinking patch. It's on their bellies and thighs. They use it to absorb water directly through the skin. Well, that could save some time. Most caterpillar species have around 4,000 muscles in their body, and almost 250 of them are in the head alone. Christmas tree worms are much more beautiful than you can imagine. But even though the pines look awesome, two-thirds of the worm's body is hidden in a calcium carbonite tube. And the point of this is… I don't have one. Narwhals' famous tusks are actually their teeth that are kind of turned inside out. These unicorns of the sea have just two teeth. And in males, one of them grows right through their upper lip. Unlike your teeth, this one is tough inside and sensitive and soft on the outside. The anteater doesn't have teeth, but it's not a problem. This creature has a super long tongue. This tongue helps the animal lap up more than 35,000 termites and ants every day. Well, that's one way to lick hunger. The flea can jump more than 200 times their body length. If humans had such an ability, they would jump as high as the Empire State Building. Woohoo! The red-eyed tree frog's eggs can hatch earlier if they sense their environment isn't safe. Small animals with fast metabolism see in slow-mo. This helps them escape larger creatures. Koalas' fingerprints are very, very similar to the human ones. Sometimes these animals' fingerprints even get confused at crime scenes. Probably in Australia. The hippo's sweat is pink and not exactly sweat. It's a reddish, oily fluid. Its function is to not cool the body, but to moisturize the skin and protect it. This fluid also functions as an antibiotic. So, you get sunburn or cut, you can smear a hippo all over you. Polar bear skin is black, and the hairs of their coat are hollow and almost see-through. These animals have fur growing even on the bottom of their paws. This gives them a better grip on ice and protects against cold. Some species of tarantulas, some of the largest spiders in the world, can live without food for more than two years. I still think they're creepy. Platypuses close their eyes while kissing. Uh, I mean, swimming. They have special folds of skin covering their ears and eyes. They prevent water from getting inside. These animals' nostrils also have a watertight seal. Emus can't walk backwards, but scientists aren't sure why. These flightless birds are the only ones that have calf muscles. Emus can sprint really fast. They can also travel long distances, but they can't back up. Crocodiles can't move their tongue because it's attached to the mouth roof. It keeps the throat closed and protects the animal's airway. Water snakes, dolphins, whales, alligators, crocodiles, and turtles can drown. It'll happen if they stay underwater for too long. These animals can't breathe in the water. They can just hold their breath for a very long time. Only one species of birds can fly backwards. That's hummingbirds. Hey, go talk to the emu. These tiny birds can also beat their wings up to 80 times per second. Despite what elephant shrews look like, these small animals are more closely related to elephants than shrews. Maybe that's why they have their trademark trunk-like noses. Elephant shrews use them to munch on insects. True enough. Cats, as well as other felines, can't taste sweet things. They don't have the taste buds needed for that. Too bad, more for me. Flamingos can only eat with their heads upside down. That's why their lower bill is massive and their upper bill isn't fixed. Such an arrangement is perfect for upside-down feeding. But it's the opposite of what other birds have. It's not easy being pink. Tiger skin is as striped as their fur. That's all I have to say about that. When toucans sleep, they curl into pretty tight balls. These birds can turn their head so that their tail covers their head and the beak rests on the back. So yeah, they have a ball. The ostrich has some of the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're more massive than a bird's brain. Each eye is as big as a billiard ball. All clownfish get born male, but in some circumstances, they can turn into females. This change is irreversible. Unlike most fish, when seahorses mate, they do it for life. 
Even cuter, when the mates travel, they move side by side and often hold on to each other's tails. The male usually gets stuck schlepping the luggage. Termites never sleep. They don't need to recharge their batteries. But they can eat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, on your house. The sloth needs up to 2 weeks to digest its food. Hey, take your time, no hurry, nothing on the schedule. Dogs' nose prints can be used for their identification. They are similar to human fingerprints and unique for each animal. Owls don't have eyeballs. Instead, they have eye tubes that don't move in the eye sockets. Penguins don't have external ears, but their hearing is especially sharp. Especially when they're on the lookout for polar bears. Shh, let's not tell them. Jellyfish are up to 98% water. That's why when they get washed ashore, their bodies can evaporate into the air after just a few hours. If a traffic jam happens underwater, an alligator will always give way to a manatee. Nice manners. Grizzly bears have such a strong bite that they can crush a bowling ball. So it's smart just to let them win. Giant pandas aren't picky about their sleeping spots. They usually fall asleep wherever they are, in most cases, right on the forest floor. The giant panda's newborn cubs are tiny. They weigh like a small cup of coffee and are smaller than a mouse. The red handfish can walk along the ocean floor with the help of its hands. But of course, they are not hands, but evolved fins, really. Cats don't usually meow at each other. A study has shown the felines use this way of communication mostly to get attention from us humans. And it works. Sloths can't shiver. It's not that they're too busy digesting that two-week-old meal. Their fur is sometimes covered with algae. And when they get too hot or too cold, their metabolism shuts down. During the hard times, immortal jellyfish transform themselves back into their younger state. Once they reach the stage when they're nothing but a blob of tissue, like me, these creatures start to grow again. And this process can apparently repeat again and again. The closest living relatives of the T-Rex are chickens and ostriches. Don't turn your back. The moray eel has another set of jaws that can extend from his throat. First, the main jaws close around an unlucky sea creature. Then the additional set grabs the eel's future meal with backward-pointing razor-sharp teeth. And after that, the captured animal gets dragged back into the eel's throat. I just lost my appetite. Some species of snails have hairy shells. Thanks to these hairs, snails can better stick to wet surfaces. When humpback whales hunt, they often gather in a group and apply a bubble net tactic to catch their food. The bubbles don't let the schools of fish get away. Snow leopards can't roar like other large felines. It has to do with their less developed vocal cords. But these animals can meow, growl, hiss, and even purr. Not to drift away from their group while napping, sea otters hold hands. They can also entangle themselves in giant seaweed for the same purpose. Hey, it kelps. Lions are often called the king of the prairie. I thought it was the king of the jungle. And still, up to 90% of all the hunting in the pride is done by the females. The males are in charge of protecting the territory and the pride members. And they make the delicious potato salad known as Hakuna Matator. Cats are famous for their uncanny ability to move their ears. All because kitties have 32 muscles in each outer ear. Some shark species can glow in the dark. Unfortunately, only other sharks can see this greenish glimmer. You have up to 8,000 taste buds, but your pooch has just a bit over 1,500. The blue jay can imitate other birds. Its favorite is a hawk's call. The blue jay uses it to scare away other birds from its territory. Slow lorries are insanely cute and just as treacherous. They're the only known <laughs> venomous primates. They have a gland in the crook of their inner arm. It secretes toxins that can cause unpleasant consequences in people. The hartebeest has an amazing evasion tactic. 
to run away from other animals, they move in a zigzag pattern. Bottlenose dolphins have names for one another. Those are specific whistles. Hey, Bob! Hey, Charlie! Hey, Dolly! Hey, boys! And thanks for all the fish! Giraffes have long, and I mean it, black tongues. Scientists suppose this color might protect the tongue from getting sunburned. Well, that's all I got. See ya! Alright, you're scuba diving in the ocean, watching corals and colorful fish flitting by, when suddenly an enormous shadow appears above you. You look up and see a massive creature approaching you, its mouth a gaping abyss. Relax, just stay still and you'll be fine. This leviathan is a basking shark, one of the scary sea monsters that isn't really capable of doing harm to anyone. Basking sharks are filter feeders, just like baleen whales. They open their large mouths to swallow plankton and don't even have teeth. It's late night in the Central American jungle. You're out in the wild to watch birds and you hear flapping of wings. Excited, you look intently into your night vision goggles, only to see a face out of your worst nightmares. Ah, don't scream, you'll scare it away! It's a perfectly harmless, wrinkle-faced bat, and it isn't interested in you. These are fruit bats, and wrinkles on their faces allow them to collect fruit pieces and juice for later snacks. By the way, their Latin name, Centurocenex, was given to them for their semblance to 100-year-old humans. Walking around a Nepali National Park and deciding to wash your face in the river nearby, you freeze in terror. A crocodile is looking straight at you from no more than a few feet's distance. Then it raises its snout above the water and you exhale in relief. It's a gharial. These reptiles have long and narrow snouts that allow them to efficiently catch fish and at the same time prohibiting them from hunting any other prey. While still carnivores, gharials are pretty shy and will slither away at the sight of humans. Right now, there are no more than a thousand of these crocodilians in the whole world. So let it go. Especially if it's a girl gharial. <laughs> you dig your garden in the backyard and notice something moving on your shovel. You take a closer look and drop the tool in horror. A small creature looking like a hostile alien is scurrying away into some burrow in the ground. Eh, no worries. It's just a star-nosed mole. These critters have peculiar snouts that look like they've been blown up from within. Their eyes are small and weak, so the star on their nose helps them a lot to move around and seek food. It's always on the move, touching everything it can reach as if the tendrils were tiny fingers. Oh, you're bathing in the ocean again. Well, look to your right, there's a real toothed shark going right at you. Nah, don't panic. It's just a sand tiger shark. Neither a sand nor a tiger one, it's a vulnerable fish-eating shark that slowly swims in the seas and chases its prey from time to time. There have been no reports of it ever attacking humans, but it still has rows of sharp teeth. So don't try to touch it just in case. It may seem placid, but you don't want it to get a bite out of you, do you? Okay, from ocean to desert, you're in Australia and longing for some water. You see a likely spot and start digging the ground only to stumble upon a creature straight from the depths of neither, all covered in thorns. It eyes you suspiciously and slinks away because it's just a thorny devil. Despite its ominous name, this lizard is harmless to humans. Horn-like bumps on its skin are for protection from predators and birds of prey. The thorns are hard, but as long as you don't touch them, you're fine. Now, if you have arachnophobia, it won't calm you down. But tailless whip scorpions you might meet in North and South America, as well as Asia and Africa, are more afraid of you than you are of them. Eh, tell yourself that. These nightmarish creatures don't have stingers and won't even bite when threatened. The worst they could do, and only if you corner them – why would you do that? – is prick you with their front legs, leaving tiny puncture marks on your finger. Many people even keep them as pets, and they're quite affectionate toward their owners. Yeah. If you ever stumble upon a burrow from which a hairless, big-toothed creature is speaking at you, 
just don't mind it and let it be. Naked mole rats are the sphinx cats among rodents. They're close relatives of mole rats, but, well, naked. And they're fascinating in their own right, too. Thanks to living entirely underground, they're almost totally cold-blooded, but can conform to any temperature outside. And their flappy, wrinkled skin doesn't feel any pain at all. So pins and prickles, as well as sharp teeth, don't scare naked mole rats. You're once again lost in the jungle, this time on Madagascar. Poor you. The night has fallen, and you seek shelter. But when you think you've found a suitable tree to build a lean-to, you freeze in terror. A black, long-fingered hand appears on a tree branch right above you, and two huge yellow eyes are staring you down. Then you see a shaggy face and realize it's just a lemur. An eye-eye, more precisely. This creature is native to Madagascar and only goes out at night. So, you're lucky to see it. It fulfills a role of a woodpecker in tropical forests. It knocks on tree trunks to find bugs and uses its long, wizened fingers to reach inside. Tired of being scared, you seek your way home, but your horrors aren't over yet. There's a big red and white snake across your path. It hisses and lies in wait for you to move. You know it's a coral snake, a really dangerous, venomous kind. You stop in your tracks, and only when it finally slithers away, you realize it was actually a milk snake. They often mimic venomous ones, not only coral snakes, to protect themselves from predators. Still, if you're not a snake expert, it's always best to stay away. Okay, this creature will infest your darkest dreams. A giant African millipede. It's big, it's glossy black, and it has hundreds of tiny crawly legs. And yet, if it had googly eyes, it could even be cute. Perhaps that's why so many people keep them as pets. That, and because they commonly live up to 10 years. Giant millipedes can't really bite. Their only defense is curling into a tight ball and secreting irritating liquid from the pores of its skin. If you dare touch it, don't rub your eyes or nose afterwards. It's quite unpleasant. Goliath Bird Eater is another popular pet creepy crawler. It isn't dangerous for humans, despite it looking like your worst nightmare. This is one of the largest spiders in the world, and as its name implies, it sometimes hunts small birds for food. But they aren't part of its regular diet. The spider prefers worms and amphibians. Make sure you don't frighten it, though. It can still bite or release hairs in self-defense. The bite is similar to a wasp sting, and hairs can cause severe irritation on your skin. But mostly, this gentle giant is just shy and will crawl away at the sight of you. Oh dear, there's another snake approaching you, and fast! You're about to turn and run when you see a hulking eight-legged form cutting into the snake's path and leaping on it. It's another arachnid, and it looks even more terrifying than the snake. It's a camel spider. Not really a spider, nor a scorpion. These creatures belong to a separate family. They became the stuff of many urban legends, but in fact, they don't even have any venom. Sure, they can bite, and their jaws are pretty powerful, but camel spiders can't do much more to a human than just bite. They hide in the sand and burrow to leap on unsuspecting lizards, invertebrates, and yes, even snakes. And now, picture a pill bug. Not exactly a beauty, but since it's small, it's okay. But what if it were 10 times as large? No, definitely not okay. Still, such a creature exists, and it's a giant isopod. Thankfully, it lurks in deep, dark, and cold waters, so it won't ever come up in your backyard. Giant isopods grow to such enormous size because of something called deep-sea gigantism. Deep-dwelling creatures have to endure great pressure of water, extreme cold temperatures, and scarce food, so their metabolism slows down. Isopods don't move much, and more often than not, just lie in wait until some poor small bug or crustacean crawls within their reach and they can munch on it. And though it looks like a many-legged chaos from below, a giant isopod can hurt you even if it wanted to. Just pet it already. And they're off. 
The Nile crocodile easily outswims the hippo. They're swimming upstream against a heavy current. But the croc's body is built for swimming through rough water. It weighs as much as two refrigerator freezers and is thought to be the heaviest reptile on Earth. It can swim up to 22 miles per hour. The hippo can't swim. Not really. It just walks on the bottom of the river and pushes off from any big rock it finds. It can close its nostrils whenever it wants to be able to glide a bit through the water, but it's no match for the croc. The croc reaches the shore and starts running through a field. But better make way. The hippo's catching up. It's speeding across the flat terrain. Even though it's huge, the hippo can outsprint a human. The croc was miles ahead, but the hippo's faster on foot. The hippo breaks through the ribbon. It's all over! Beep, beep! Hey there, Roadrunner! What you running from? Wait, hold everything. That coyote is catching up fast. He's right on your tail. The greater Roadrunner can run up to 20 miles per hour, even faster when it's really hungry. Despite what you see in cartoons, a coyote is actually twice as fast as a Roadrunner. But the cartoon version is way funnier. In lane 1, from the dense jungles of South America, the ever-slow sloth. And right underneath him, in lane 2, we have a typical garden snail. And the race is on for the slowest animal on Earth. With the sloth's top speed clocking in at 0.2 miles per hour, it's no wonder they call it a giant moving pillow. Well, I call them that. The snail is off to a good start. It can cover a small neighborhood in about an hour. This boneless creature has only one foot, which is covered in protective slime. It's too blurry to see, but I think the sloth is still in the same spot. And now it's asleep. It'll probably be asleep through the whole race. A sloth can snooze it up for 15 hours a day. It's asleep for more than half of its life. And look, the snail got out of that sunny patch. Next up, a shady patch. Ooh, it's too close to call. We'll have to wait till the sloth wakes up to get back to this race. A grizzly bear can easily outrun a human. If you're at a picnic and you cook up something a little too yummy, better leave your lunch behind. The fastest a human can sprint is 28 miles per hour, set, of course, by Usain Bolt. So he'd probably be able to run away in time. If you're slower than him, which you are, then you're in trouble. In a one-on-one sprint between a human and a grizzly bear, you're going to be the bear's lunch every time. But out of all the bears, which one's the fastest? Polar bears, grizzly bears, brown bears, sun bears, and the cute cuddly panda bear. On your marks, get set, go! The tension is palpable. The grizzly and the brown bear are claw to claw. A brown bear can easily run as fast as a grizzly. The sun bear is the smallest bear in the race. It's about 6 feet long, or tall, or whatever. It just can't keep up. The polar bear got off to a great start, but it just doesn't have the speed of the grizzly or brown bear. Grizzly takes the lead. No, it's the brown bear. Now grizzly. Wait, where's panda? What's it doing? I don't think it knows it's a race, but isn't it cute? It just finished its third bamboo stick. A panda bear can eat up to 28 pounds of bamboo a day. That's like, a lot. But it's off. It found its shortcut and is rolling down that hill. It zooms past the grizzly and the brown bear. It's all over! Panda wins! Sorry, bears. We all know that the panda isn't exactly fast. It's actually one of the slowest bears. Still, if you see a panda rolling down the hill in your direction, run! A Boeing 747 has a top speed of around 620 miles per hour. The fastest bird is the gray-headed albatross. It can fly up to 80 miles per hour and stay up there for 10 hours without landing. The peregrine falcon is faster, but only when it's diving straight down to grab some takeout. Watch out, pigeon! Wow! Big planes take a long time to get up in the air, but the albatross? It's up and off in a few seconds. It's in the lead! But a few minutes later, back to Slowmoville. The sloth's awake. That's good. But so far, it's only managed to lift its arm to reach that tree branch. The garden snail's still trying to get past that big rock. Sloths spend a lot of their time as motionless as possible, so that they don't become someone else's breakfast. Not great training for a race. But hold on! Player 3 has entered the race. It's the Galapagos tortoise. Its powerful front legs carry this tank of an animal. It's a whopping four times faster than a garden snail. 
This just got interesting. We got ourselves the race that'll last a century. The tortoise is running and dodging every obstacle. Nothing can stop it. Hey, no cheating, sloth. Don't be dropping tree branches from up there. Deep underground, a mole's busy burrowing around. A mole can eat as many earthworms as his own body weight and can dig around 15 feet per hour. The American badger is the fastest digging animal in the world and is surprisingly fast on land. It can almost match the speed of a human on a good day. Head to head, the American badger wins the tunnel race pretty easily. Too bad the mole can't see where it's going. Moles aren't really blind. They just have terrible eyesight and they're colorblind. And they can't wear glasses down there. Ah, the proud cheetah. It's sprinting across the savanna at warp speed. I've been the fastest land mammal for millions of years. I got this. The fastest cheetah on record was a sprinter named Sarah. When she was 11, she ran the 100 meters in under 6 seconds. A cheetah can run up to 80 miles per hour if it sees something tasty. Sarah was raised in an American zoo and was one of the first cheetahs to have a puppy buddy when she was growing up. Alexa and Sarah, friends forever. But soaring above Sarah is a humble little bat. And that bat is making Sarah look slow. The Brazilian free-tailed bat can hit 100 miles per hour. It's the fastest mammal on the planet. Now, time for some shrinking. First to the blocks is the Australian tiger beetle. It charges forward at 6 miles per hour. It may not seem like much, but relative to its size, it's lightning fast. That's like a human running alongside a high-speed train. Running in the inside lane is the Saharan silver ant. Ants are team players and are strongest when they're working together. But even one ant can be amazingly strong. An ant can lift hundreds of times its own weight and can sprint like there's no tomorrow. Hussein Bull can hit four strides per second. This silver ant does 50. Scientists even discovered that these little ants like to gallop once they reach their top speed. Our last contender, the fastest animal on Earth. It's none other than this tiny mite. It's only the size of a sesame seed. If we go by body lengths per second, this microscopic animal outruns everything else on the planet. It's believed to run almost twice as fast as the tiger beetle. And if it were human size, it would run faster than the speed of sound. Um, let's get back to the crawlers. They finish yet? The tortoise is in the lead. The snail finally got past that large rock, and the sloth is on its way to branch number two. The tortoise is three feet away from the finish line. Wow, I just can't take much more of this excitement. But I think I have time for a latte. Hey there, Brightsiders. My name is Tom, and today I have a question for you. Did you know that in the foreseeable future, pet robots will be present in every other household? They're just like regular dogs, except, well... Robotic. And they'll even get along with real pooches, too. If you're wondering if uh, nowadays there are robots that were inspired by animals, I've got you covered. Cockroaches. Love them or not, they're here to stay. Look at those legs and hard shell they've got. They give me the creeps. But they've been around for 400 million years, so I guess they're not going anywhere. They're also incredibly fast. Well, for insects. It will take them about an hour to run three miles, and that's pretty impressive for uh, an animal that size. Not only that, but uh, put them underwater and they'll hold their breath for up to 40 minutes. Got a tiny hole? They'll fit in there because of their malleable body and apparently at the speed of light too. Rude! There they go. Their adaptation power is so strong that you can press them with 900 times their body weight and there won't even be a scratch on their shells. Ask anyone. These things are hard to get rid of. It's no wonder scientists would want to make a robot similar to a cockroach. They sound almost invincible. Researchers at UC Berkeley did exactly that. They created CRAM, which stands for Compressible Robot with Articulated Mechanisms. It's a robot the size of your palm designed to do the same incredible things cockroaches do. It has jointed plastic shell so it can squeeze into places too. 
Its main purpose is search and rescue missions. Off you go, you little robotic roach. Still on tiny animals. NASA has taken inspiration from a war. They might be at the bottom of the food chain, but not their robotic twins. It's meant to explore the frozen places humans can't go to, specifically in Antarctica or Mount Erebus. I feel cold just thinking about it. It doesn't move exactly like a worm though. It has two screws attached to both its ends and it screws itself to the wall every time it wants to move. But here's what makes it special. Every time it's screwed to a wall, it collects data. NASA believes it can be further improved for space exploration. I guess it wouldn't be an ice worm anymore, it'd be more like a space worm? And also the first worm to ever go to space. Don't forget your space helmet. Going down in caves, we find bats. Looking like vampires after they've shapeshifted, sleeping upside down, hanging from literal rocks. Look at those gorgeous black wings. Mysterious, yet fascinating. I present to you the Badbot. No, not the Batmobile, the Badbot. It's a robotic bat. It doesn't weigh very much, and it's not very big, but it sure is impressive. Its wings replicate the elasticity of regular bat wings. The team developing this robot had to create a custom silicon membrane just for this. These bat robots are very energy efficient too, which probably means that they can fly for a long time. Sort of like the sustainable flight real bats have. Let's take to the oceans now. And this robot you're looking at is a fish. And guess what? It lives next to the real fish as well. It's called Sofi, and it's very similar looking to a fish. It's made half out of silicon and rubber and half out of electronics. The front is 3D printed and it's where all the electronics are. The best part of its construction is that it can bump against anything and not be damaged or hurt any marine life forms. Still, it's probably not a good thing if it goes around just headbutting other fish. That seems quite rude. Okay, here's something interesting. The way to control this robot is with a Super Nintendo controller. So if you're into video games like me, you'd love this. And if you're wondering how it doesn't just sink to the bottom of the ocean, that's because it has a buoyancy control unit aboard. This allows whoever is controlling it to decide whether it rises or sinks. Oh, and to top it all off and complete the look, SoFi Robot has a fisheye lens at its front. Cheetahs run very fast at about 65 to 70 miles per hour. Look at it go! It's the fastest animal on earth. Put it against a really fast car and it might even reach 0 to 60 miles per hour faster. 3, 2, 1, go! Yep, that's fast all right. Still, one thing we still haven't seen cheetahs do is a backflip. This robot has us covered. Here's the Cheetah 3. It is supposedly indestructible and it does backflips too. It was mostly built so scientists could experiment crazy things on it and it does look like a cheetah, so the name is appropriate. It doesn't run as fast though, 10 miles per hour to be exact. Okay, so it can't race cars but it can backflip, so one point to the regular cheetah and one point to the robotic one. I guess they're even. This next one is inspired by snakes. Yes, those slimy hissy fellas. It's called the Snake Robot, and again, its purpose is search and rescue missions. It moves like a snake, and it climbs trees just like a snake would, by wrapping itself around them. It's already been used to search collapsed buildings after strong earthquakes. Since it's small and can move in any direction, it's perfect to fit into tight spots. Instead of two googly eyes, this robot has one camera in the front, so whoever's controlling it can look at its surroundings. If you're into spiders, 
but are still kind of afraid of them, like me, there's a solution. The Robactix T8X. It's more of a toy than anything else. You can control it and program it to do whatever you feel like. Move it around and make it dance with its tiny little legs. There's two versions of it, a hairy one and a smooth one. The hairy one probably resembles a tarantula. My name is Tom, thank you for watching and remember, let's become smarter every day together with Brightside. Bye. Psst, run. Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock, knock. A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The Takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of Takahes was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one. The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906, but on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, 
in the Chaco Forest, to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horn marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland, who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Now well, that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to birdwatchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again, so what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. 
Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? Ah, isn't it a cute horse standing over there? But wait, is it sleeping? In reality, the animal you see is just dozing. It'll still need to lie down to have proper REM, which stands for rapid eye movement sleep. In people, this is the stage when we dream. Your arms and legs can't move during REMs. If they did, you'd start to act your dreams out and could accidentally hurt yourself. But back to that horse. Even though it's only dozing while standing up, that's still an impressive feat. You won't be able to repeat it. Horses have a system of tendons and ligaments that help them stay upright with ease. The major joints in the legs get locked, and the animal can relax and catch some Zs without worrying about crashing to the ground. Oh, by the way, the amount of REM sleep horses need is surprisingly small. Usually, it's a series of short intervals, two or three hours a day in total. That's why they don't have to lie down often. But some animals do it just because they feel more comfortable that way. Horses take naps while standing because sleeping isn't safe enough when they're lying down. It's rather tricky for a horse to get up from the ground, and it's a waste of precious time. While a horse is struggling to get to its feet, some meat-eater can tackle the animal down and uh, make it its dinner. That's why horses only lie down for short periods of time. They also have a special lookout system, when one animal is watching over the others while they're napping. Each member of the herd gets to play the role of the watch horse. Anyway, not only horses, but also zebras, elephants, giraffes, some birds like flamingos, and sometimes even cows can take naps while standing up. But then, why not humans? Well, to pull off this trick, your legs would have to be aligned vertically and your knees be able to lock in place. Then you wouldn't need much effort to keep yourself upright. But it's not how your body's built. If you're exhausted, you might fall asleep while standing up. But you'd immediately wake up, and this would prevent your body from hitting the floor. Your muscles start to gradually relax during each next stage of sleep. And very soon after you doze off, they won't be able to hold you upright anymore. Shh! It's a quiet winter night, and the bird perched on the top tree branch seems to be sleeping. And then there's some noise. A human would hardly notice it, so quiet it is. But the owl and that's what the bird is, has perfect hearing. It's even more important for this creature than good eyesight. In the blink of an eye, the bird moves. Whoa! It looks like its head is facing backwards. Owls are so flexible, they can twist their heads in an almost full circle. These birds have fixed eye sockets, so it means their eyeballs don't rotate and they somehow have to make up for it. Twisting the head up to 270 degrees is only possible because it's connected to the body in a particular, very clever way. And the tissues and blood vessels where the neck meets the body can't snap. They're designed to flex. Owls also have many vertebrae, tiny bones that make up the spine and neck. It's another thing that helps them perform their head-swiveling trick. Now you have a totally different neck structure, but it still serves all your needs. Humans have spherical eyes and can move them freely, unlike owls. You simply don't need your neck to turn all the way around. But yes, it would be a great party trick. A goblin shark is swimming unhurriedly through the deep sea when it notices a yummy-looking fish. The shark starts to inch closer to its future meal. But the fish notices the hunter and tries to dart away. And then, like in a horror movie, the larger animal thrusts its jaw out of its mouth and grabs the fish. The goblin shark's terrifying jaws are attached to elastic ligaments. They can unfold from its snout for up to 3 inches. It allows the animal to catapult its mouth forward to catch an unfortunate fish or squid or whatnot. If only your mouth could do the same. Then you'd be able to munch on stuff dangling 7 inches away from your face without using your hands to grab the food. And no, we're not so concerned about table manners here. So you're lying on your bed in a hotel room in a tropical country and lazily watching a small gecko. It's running across the floor, reaching the wall. Hmm, look, it's scaling it. And right now, it's hanging upside down over your head. Geckos can stick to all kinds of surfaces, thanks to their bulbous toes. 
they're covered with hundreds of microscopic hairs, and each hair, in turn, splits off into even tinier bristles. This creates such a strong physical bond that the hair molecules and the surface molecules start to interact, and it creates an electromagnetic attraction. This method allows geckos to stick and unstick their toes and feet lightning fast. They can dash across different surfaces at 20 body lengths per second. Unfortunately, this super ability is also unavailable for humans. The only thing your fingers and toes can do is wrinkle after being in the water for too long. This improves your grip on wet objects by channeling the water away, just like rain treads in your car tires. And your friends can call you pruny hands. Hey, I didn't say it was a compliment. Each of the tarsier's eyes is as big as the animal's brain. That's a not-so-subtle sign that vision is crucial for these small animals. Their huge eyeballs don't move. A tarsier has to turn its whole head if it needs to look to the left or to the right. On the bright side, ding, the animal can see in almost total darkness and hunt insects, lizards, and small birds even at night. The tarsier's eyes gather and reflect even the tiniest specks of light. It gives the creature a clear picture of what's happening around. That's why these eyes are like the animal kingdom's equivalent of night vision goggles. As for us humans, our eyes are designed in a different way. We see exceptionally well only during daylight hours. In a dark room or outside at night, you're likely to have problems with seeing things or colors well enough. That's because there are two types of light-sensitive organs in the back of your eyes. Some are cone-shaped, others are rod-shaped. The rods help you see in dim light but they don't let you detect colors. And the cones allow you to see finer details and vibrant hues, but they don't work when the lighting is poor. So, once it's dark, only rods keep responding to available light. But since they can't distinguish colors, you only see different shades of black, gray, and white. Alright, you're sitting on the riverbank watching the water flowing when a lizard runs by at breakneck speed. Yep, right on the water! That's the Bascalus lizard. It has special long toes on its rear feet. They're equipped with fringes of skin that spread out when the animal's moving. This increases the area of contact with the water. It also helps that the lizard is pumping its legs incredibly fast. They slap hard against the surface, and this forms tiny pockets of air. These pockets keep the lizard on top of the water, but only as long as they don't slow down. Now, even if the average person had special shoes shaped like the Bascalus lizard's feet, they'd still have to run at a speed of 65 miles per hour not to go underwater. If you find yourself in the jungle of South and Southeast Asia, beware of snakes. Hey, why are you looking at the ground? I mean, flying snakes! Airborne snakes sound like the stuff from nightmares, but they do exist. Now, they don't actually fly if there's no strong updraft, that is. These reptiles are gliders. They use the speed of freefall to catch air. Once they do, it's not a problem to generate some lift. Now, at first glance, you won't be able to tell the flying snake from any other. It has a tube-shaped body and no limbs. But then the creature starts to get ready for takeoff. It slithers to the very end of a branch and dangles, creating a J-shape with its body. Once the snake propels itself down, it changes into an S and gets twice flatter than usual. Its round body becomes curved inward and traps air. The reptile can even make turns by moving up and down, like waves on the sea. The coolest thing is that flying snakes are even better gliders than, let's say, the much more famous flying squirrels. Hey, Rocky! So, it's a hot summer day, you're outdoors enjoying the weather. You want to lie in the cool grass somewhere in the shade just to relax, but ew, looks like someone spat there, but it's actually a spittlebug's house. These guys sip a lot of watery sap from the plants, and when they process it, it forms a lot of bubbles, not less than 150 times their body mass daily. All these bubbles form a cocoon where young insects can grow safely. No bird or animal wants to eat this cocoon because it tastes bitter, as if you licked a Nintendo cartridge. Not so fast, Cheetah! Apparently, Dracula Ant is the world's fastest animal and the vampires in the ant world. They definitely win any burger-eating contest, since they're able to snap their jaws 5,000 times faster than your eye can blink. 
to understand how fast the Dracula ant is, you gotta make a video of his jaws chomping at 480,000 frames per second. At this speed, you'll see the ant slowly moving its mandibles. They don't run, but their mouths are rapid, and they move those jaws so fast, they even bend while snapping together. Now, people can do that too, snapping our fingers so that they bend. The darkest animal out there is the IM-70 chicken. Not only these guys have black feathers, eyes, and claws, they also have black bones. The color is bluish black, and it is deep. If you ever try those chicken wings, they'll look as if someone had marinated them in blackberry juice or squid ink. They say Marco Polo was the first to have discovered these odd or charming roosters. Back in 1298, the explorer wrote about a breed of chickens that were as black as cats and laid the best eggs. This freshwater fish has been around since the beginning of the 20th century and probably remembers good old times with black and white and even silent movies. One big mouth buffalo made it till 112 years old. Still, the world's oldest creatures live in the sea. There are deep sea sponges that are 11,000 years old, and they're safe and sound. This fish has incredible gills, which lets it hold its breath for over four minutes. Meet the coffin fish, a weird looking but tough animal. They're also famous as sea toads. They actually look much more like toads, not classic fish with fins and scales. They can also inflate because of the seawater they gulp, so they expand just like a balloon. In fact, this superability lets this fish hold its breath for several minutes because they actually get the oxygen from the water they keep inside. But the absolute champion is the human. The world's champion can survive holding the breath for over 20 minutes. There are some animals that make their own clothes. Sponge crabs make a sort of hat from sponges to protect them from underwater bad guys. To figure out how the crabs decided on their outfit, researchers gave them some foam sponges that were different in sizes. The bigger the crab is, the bigger the sponge it chooses. They use various techniques to get this perfect shape, starting from cutting out a small hole for the head, and then they see if the size fits them. If they're good to go, they continue to cut and dig into that sponge until it becomes a perfect hat. Recently, researchers have spotted a moth that would drink birds' tears while they sleep. So far, there were only three registered cases of animals feeding on other animals' tears. These were some Amazon butterflies, solitary bees, and moths. Their regular diet mostly includes nectar, but it does lack essential salts that aren't that easy to find elsewhere. Not only do they drink birds' tears, they also drink turtles' tears, crocodiles' tears, and those of many mammals found in the Amazon jungle. Really? Crocodile tears? Some sea dwellers can emit red light. For example, the stoplight loose jaw fish uses it to catch dinner. Shrimps don't see the red light, so the loose jaw fish can spot any red shrimp emitting pulses of red light and catches it without scaring the dinner away. Mammals can glow too. A flying squirrel glows under UV light, emitting pink light. It happens because they're able to absorb light and emit it back in another wavelength. The platypus may not have the largest cheek pouches, but they're definitely the weirdest. They keep gravel inside those pouches to help mash the food they normally eat. Worms, shellfish, snails. These guys are toothless, so gravel comes in handy when it comes to chewing the food. It works just like a blender. Ooh, makes you wonder what they use for the mouthwash, huh? Now, if humans had the same incredible cheeks just like chipmunks have, we'd be able to transport our groceries right in our mouths. In fact, chipmunks can transport something as large as themselves in their oversized mouth luggage sections. Hamsters have the same superpower, too, and can even carry their young in the mouth in case of the need to run away. A baby carrot, which seems tiny for a human but significantly large for a hamster, can disappear without a trace in between those huge cheeks. The Mariana snailfish, which logically lives in the Mariana Trench, is relatively small. It's as large as two medium candy bars. Despite the size, they can easily withstand the pressure that equals 1,600 elephants standing on it. This fish has a unique body structure. For example, it has some gaps in the skull. 
If their skull was uniform and had no holes, it would never withstand the pressure in the depths of the Mariana Trench. Plus, their cartilage skeleton is soft and flexible. They also have no actual eyes, but they really don't need them since they live in complete darkness in the world's deepest trench. Hey, meet the Pinocchio frog. Not hard to guess, their nose can grow in size in the blink of an eye in various situations. Whenever they feel danger coming, it gets larger. When these frogs are calm and feel safe, it goes back to normal. It may also elongate when they want to attract mates, and probably when they croak a lot. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Do you enjoy it when it rains? You probably grab a cup of hot chocolate, cover yourself up with a blanket, and sit on the windowsill, looking at the drops dripping down the window. If you like it, you're definitely not a Myanmar snub-nosed monkey that's been recently discovered, guess where, in Myanmar. Their nostrils are so upturned and exposed to the outer world that they sneeze every time it rains. But if you were in a choir, you have something in common. Snub-nosed monkeys like singing together. Amazon Pink River Dolphins aren't born pink. Their young are always gray, but the older they get, the pinker they turn. It's like people having wrinkles when they age, and these guys simply get a different color. Hey, I like to get a little pink instead of those smile lines. You'd certainly love to be a termite because of their crazy sleep schedule. They actually never sleep, and the only thing they do is nibble on the wooden pegs they see around them. Well, if you're afraid of gaining weight because of a cellulose-rich diet, you could probably turn into a snail. They get a power nap for some hours and then can run without sleep for as long as 30 hours in a row. No fish can survive for any significant period of time without water, except this one. The African lungfish. When they feel something's wrong, they start secreting a mucus cocoon and go underground, give or take 9 inches under the soil. They have a built-in tube to breathe. Mountain stoneweed is, native to New Zealand, aren't afraid of drastic temperature changes. Their blood contains a special protein that doesn't let their blood crystallize in case of extreme temperatures. They tolerate any cold better than polar bears and even penguins, who live in the officially world's coldest place, Antarctica. Ring-tailed lemurs have one of the craziest ways of conflict resolution. They have stink fights. Taking into account the average number of lemurs in a group, about 20 or 30 animals, you'll see there's a lot of competition. Their scent glands are on their wrists and shoulders. Those on the wrists are harmless. The odor they produce is quite volatile. Those on the shoulders are nasty and produce brown, funky-smelling paste that would outlast any perfume. So back off! Uh-oh, villains are everywhere on Earth! Why they showed up all at once, we'll never know. What we need is a hero! Hopefully one that doesn't wear their underwear on the outside. Time to step up, scientists! Down in the lab, they're already busy selecting the best bits of DNA nature has to offer. The plan? Take the best bits from different animals and mix it all into the ultimate all-natural superhero serum. Superheroes are fast, very fast. Nature's hero needs quick reflexes, and none compare to the long-legged fly. When startled, this fly has a response time of less than 5 milliseconds. If you tried to photograph this little guy, it would come out blurry 9 times out of 10. Hey, must be camera shy. But being able to dodge out of a photo might not be the exact skill our hero needs. How about some DNA from one of the smartest invertebrates? I'm talking about lightning-fast reflexes and amazing reaction skills. Octopuses <laughs> are one of nature's greatest escape artists. They're even smarter than some humans. Hmm, maybe a lot of humans. Each octopus has three hearts and nine brains. Oh, and it hates wearing a suit to work. Every arm, they're actually not tentacles, has a brain of its own, with a central donut-looking brain controlling the body as a whole. That means each arm can move around like its own person. It can react faster than a pro baseball player, even with eight gloves. But that's not all the octopus can give our hero. They, along with cuttlefish, have sweet camouflage skills. 
their skin can match the color, texture, and pattern of their background. Hide and seek champions, members of that family, so basically squid, cuttlefish, snails, slugs, and the super genius octopus are actually colorblind. Scientists are as confused as you are. What makes these creatures unique is that they have light-sensing cells all over their skin, not just in their eyes. Imagine being able to see with your entire body. 360 vision, not bad for a superhero. Super strength is the next challenge, and the dung beetle's ready to step up. It can pull over a thousand times its own weight, so relative to body weight, it's the strongest animal out there. That's like you hauling around 13 elephants, or 35,000 chihuahuas. Hey, where'd all those dogs even come from? The dung beetle makes it look easy. Plus, it moves objects around by doing a handstand. Our hero definitely needs that. Time for protection. If you're expecting nature to lend us pangolin or armadillo skin DNA, you'd be way off. Nature's hero needs to be agile, too. The best bet is to mix in some camel skin DNA. It's a desert animal, so it makes sense that its skin is ridiculously tough. It can withstand the burning hot desert sand and the blazing hot sun. At least, scientists didn't choose whale skin, even though it's the toughest by far. Having skin over a foot thick might give a superhero great protection, but getting through a door would be a real problem. There's two main things that life needs in order to survive. Oxygen and water. Our hero shouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff, especially if villains are around. Scientists decide to mix in a little Bornean flathead frog and thorny devil lizard DNA. That way our hero won't ever have to stop by the convenience store for some bottled water. The flat-headed frog doesn't need lungs. Its body absorbs oxygen through its skin. Being so flat gives it a huge surface area. It isn't exactly the most efficient way to get oxygen, so it's a good thing the frog doesn't need to move around too much. The thorny lizard can give our hero protection, but it's also got a clever water transportation technique. It sucks up water through its feet, so it never needs to stop for a drink. Just like a sponge, the water defies gravity and gets sucked upwards. So nature's hero just needs to step on something wet instead of carrying a bottle around. Being a superhero is hard work and takes time. We don't need our hero stopping for a taco every couple of hours instead of saving the world. The green sea slug drifts around shallow waters, trying to find itself some delicious algae. Once it's had its fill, it's done. For months, or even forever. It's one of the only animals on Earth that can photosynthesize, that thing that plants do to get energy. It's basically its very own solar battery. It doesn't need to stop and eat all the time like us, which also saves a whole bunch of bathroom time. No more bathroom breaks for the new breed of nature's heroes. Pop some of that DNA in the mix for sure. All superheroes have some sort of super speed. Nature's hero needs just that. Time to talk flying speed. The peregrine falcon can easily reach speeds of up to 55 miles per hour flapping their wings. Not exactly lightning fast but their true speed lies in their dive. The falcon spots its target at a distance, does some quick calculation, and drops it over 200 miles per hour. With pinpoint accuracy, these birds have evolved their bodies to be totally aerodynamic. When they dive, they're still able to breathe through their nose and see their dinner. They've got a rod and fin in each nostril to slow the airflow. Their eyes have special shields that block out any dust. And bam! Dinner is served! Now, diving that fast is great, but nature's hero needs to fly straight as well. We're going to need to add in some great maneuverability. That calls for a very special flyer, but it isn't a bird. The Brazilian free-tailed bat hardly weighs anything, but that doesn't stop it from being the most agile flying creature. Reaching speeds of up to 100 miles per hour in horizontal flight, This little mammal is nature's acrobat of the sky. Definitely gonna need some of that. Lightweight and agile, the perfect combination for nature's hero. Plus, a bat's biosonar vision might come in handy for some late-night crime solving. We have speed and strength. What a combo! 
But what a real hero needs is a bit of wham power. Nature's hero is going to need the power of the mantis shrimp. It has a punch force of 340 pounds. That's like having a panda fall on you. It has a jab speed of 50 miles per hour underwater, which is so fast it actually makes a shockwave. If the fist doesn't get you, the shockwave will. Its swing is so powerful and fast, it can actually boil water. Nature's hero is also going to need a big dose of the fastest jaw in the world. The trap jaw ant can close its jaws at an amazing 140 miles per hour. That's 2,000 times faster than you can blink and faster than I can read this. This bite isn't only for protection, they also use it to make a stylish gadget – its very own ejector seat. When it bites the ground at warp speed, it can launch 1.5 feet into the air. Now, that doesn't sound very high, but when they do it as a group, ant popcorn everywhere! Scale that up to human size, and nature's hero would have a serious vertical leap. Nature's got our hero set for survival, flight, speed, camouflage, never needing to use a public toilet, jumping with its mouth, drinking water out of a puddle. Hmm, what other powers would nature's hero need? What about durability? To give our hero the best chance of survival, we need to mix in a big spoonful of tardigrade DNA. This tiny thing only lives about two years when not exposed to extreme conditions. Not exactly a world record. So what makes it so special? This little creature has been found all over the planet in some seriously extreme locations. Antarctica, the Sahara Desert, even on Mount Everest. It can even survive being in space, with no spacesuit. Astronauts put them outside their space station for 10 days. No water, no oxygen, no food. How do they survive? Well, they can turn on hibernation at will. So when the going gets tough, they just slow their body functions way down. Until someone's kind enough to let them back in the space station. A little tardigrade DNA and nature's hero would be able to survive anything. Ah, the perfect superhero DNA serum. Hopefully, this recipe doesn't get into the wrong hands. <laughs>